Good morning, church. What a joy that this morning, once again, I can meet you uh, through God's Word. And uh, I'd like to welcome all of you who are watching through the internet, through our online platform. I pray that uh, this message will be a blessing to you. For those of you who are viewing it, uh, if you like it, just click like. And if you want to share it to somebody, please do by all means. And to those of you who are following us, I really want to thank you for your faith and confidence in NCCKL. Amen, church. Uh, this morning, church, uh, we are into a brand new month, the month of May. The focus on ambition. Uh, if you notice that the whole month of April, we spoke extensively on devotion. And I choose to believe that each one of us at our church has been richly blessed to the various preachers who gave us so many different outlooks on devotion. But this whole month, we're going to talk about ambition. Hallelujah. Let me just give you a preview of this word ambition before I really get into our message proper. I had a time to look into the Bible dictionary. Now I was looking through and I look for this word ambition. This is what it says, the Bible dictionary. The word ambition is defined as an aspiration to achieve a particular goal, whether good or bad. Uh, this definition alludes that ambition can be a powerful ally or a destructive enemy. If our ambition is misplaced in any way and fueled by shallow ones and superficial desires, we will find ourselves perpetually dissatisfied, and ultimately discontented. Furthermore, ambition is also seen as an intense drive for success or power, a desire to achieve honor, wealth, or fame. To be ambitious in the worldly sense is essentially to be determined, basically to have a resolve, to be resilient, to have a greed, to have more than your neighbor. Ambition always strives to be number one. Instead, throughout this month, I believe as your shepherd, we are going to hear what the Bible says about ambition, which is completely a whole new dimension in Christ. And I found it very interesting in, uh, found the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Here Paul is admonishing the Thessalonians by urging them to make it their ambition to lead quiet life. Paul wants them to mind their own business. <laughs> it is what Paul says to them. And to work with their own hands. I just paraphrase for you that scripture. You know, while the world teaches us to go all out to be the best, to have a bigger house, a fancier car, a larger paycheck, the Bible teaches us the opposite, church. Also, I found this in Philippians 2, 3. This really is very close to my heart, this verse. Paul states the Philippians now. He says here, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. To add on to that, in 2 Corinthians, now to the Corinthian church, Paul admonishes as well in 5 9. He says this Therefore, whether we are at home on earth or away from home and with him in heaven, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to Him. God wants us to be always pleasing to Him. The Bible teaches us that we should be ambitious. There's nothing wrong being ambitious, church. Yet the objective should always be primarily to be one that's accepted by Christ, not by the world. In fact, Christ taught us that to be first in the kingdom of God is to become a servant. In Galatians 1.10, Paul posed an insightful question. He asked this question, Am I now trying to win 
the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? And he answered his own question. If we are still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. In the Amplified Version will say, I'm not even fit to be a born servant. Later, Paul reiterated the same thing again. He says here, yeah, on the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel of God's righteousness. We notice that Paul is basically affirming a truth proclaimed by Jesus himself, our master, in John 5, 44, where Christ said this, How can you believe if you accept praise from another, yet make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the only God? As elects, we must ask, what is our ambition to please God or to please men? Scripture clearly teaches that those who seek honor and esteem from men cannot please God. Those whose ambitions is to be popular with the world cannot be true and faithful servants of Jesus. If our ambition is to seek the things of the world, in truth, we are self-seeking church and denying Christ and his sacrifice for us through his baptism, death and resurrection. But if it is our ambition to seek and honor Christ, we are assured of his profound promises in the scriptures. In view of this, as elects at NCCKL, it is imperative for God's elect whose faith arrested on God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection to know what is God's perspective on ambition according to the scriptures. The wisdom offered in the Bible has stood the test of time and it can benefit us immensely if we submit and effectively apply it in our daily lives as written in Matthew 6 verse 33, a very popular portion of scripture. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added to you. You know, I believe throughout the month of May, you'll be prepared to be drilled with messages on ambition by our very own preachers at NCCKL with a united voice so that we as a church may fulfill our theme for 2021. My life for his glory. To do all things to the glory of God. Church, it's my advice to you. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When we get overly ambitious and ready to take a plunge into disastrous waters, I truly believe anointed messages by our very own preachers will stop you on your track. On the other hand, trustworthy, godly instruction by them, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, will give us, the elects, a powerful affirmation of a good and godly ambition to pursue in life for the glory of God. Elects can then carry with them and always be cautious Whenever they sense the alignment in Christ is steering, of course, being diverted or being misdirected by any situations in life. This morning, taking into account of our monthly focus on ambition, I've entitled my message as Godly Obsession. I only had one word from the Lord, the word praise. I was wondering, how am I to talk about praise? Particularly when our focus on ambition. And then the Lord said that that should be our godly obsession. 
to praise God. As elects, it's very important that we are to be ambitious, to have godly obsession, to praise God in all circumstances. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul commands believers that in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know the scripture that says that we are to please God. How do we please God? We please God by believing in Him, by faith, and thanking Him in all circumstances. And that has got to be a godly obsession. You know, we are so obsessed with many things in this world, humanly speaking. But spiritual obsession is also good when it's directed towards the glory of God. And we have got to have godly obsession to praise God in every given situation. My key text is taken from Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 18. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the wines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in God of my salvation. What a declaration. What an affirmation by Prophet Habakkuk. Have you, church, ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation like the Prophet Habakkuk? Even right now and during the pandemic, just hit the whole world. It's surging relentlessly. I know people are perplexed and are in distress. We too are not spared at NCCKL. As day goes by, I'm observing. We are beginning to experience the tremendous pressure, fear, uncertainty due to the unending crisis. Many are worried what vaccination to take. Many are worried about their children. You know, their school life being affected. Schools are being closed. Many can't travel to visit their loved ones. Many can't even visit the hospital for other illness in their body. So there are many things that's really giving us tremendous pressure and uncertainty. I don't know about you. If you haven't been there yet, you continue. You know, continue living as what God has intended for your life. But if you are there, I just want to caution you that this is a very important time how we exercise our faith in God's righteousness. Make no mistake, apart from this current turmoil that we are facing, be rest assured, let me say this to you with love, be prepared to face many more complex issues thrown at us when we choose to be ambitious with godly obsession to praise God in all circumstances. The truth is, life comes with problems of building. As elects, we might as well understand it and accept it as part and parcel of life. We are living in the last days, church. Whether you like it or not, the days are numbered. We know God has spoken so clearly in the scriptures. In the last days, we will face many trials. Satan is intensifying the attack on God's children. We are not going to get through this life without trouble, church, without hardship, without pain, without getting our hearts troubled, without being persecuted, without being despised, without being betrayed, or even without being deceived in life. Let us make it our ambition to have godly obsession, to praise God by giving thanks in everything because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. With this, I'd like to give you only two points today. Only two points. To talk to you about godly obsession. Point number one. Praise God even if it doesn't make sense. As your shepherd, this is my desire for you. And I pray that you would love to do this. All that we have to do is this. To look in the Bible and see what the precepts of faith did so that we may have godly obsession to praise God in times that doesn't make sense. 
Because I find that throughout the Bible, from Genesis right up to the book of Revelation, many went through many trials, tribulations, tragedies, crisis after crisis. But yet they all did one thing right. They never stopped praising God, even though it did not make sense. David was a great man of God, a great king of Israel, a worshipper of God. But that did not exempt David from pain and hardship. And if we study the life of David, we realize that he was a man of sorrow who endured many trials in life. Personal problem, family problem, children's problem, nation's problem. He always went through. But one thing we find, David had always had praise in his heart for God and God alone. Then looking at Job's life, we find that though this guy was a righteous man, but throughout his life spell, until God blessed him, he endured more grief and pain than would seem impossible, humanly speaking. And I can go on and on. There are many characters in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, Peter, John. The Old Testament, Zechariah, Jeremiah, and so many. And every one of them, they had godly obsession. They knew one thing, that they have a praise in their heart for God, no matter what happens to them. Sometimes you wonder, how could one go on and still a praise in their hearts, even if it doesn't make sense? Sometimes life hurts church. Let's be real about it. I know some of you, even right now, you're going through immense pressure. Sometimes we are in the pit. Sometimes we are in the fire. And sometimes we are on the mountain calling fire down from heaven. And last Sunday I spoke to you. A sermon on the journey to the supernatural. Sometimes we are hiding in the cave like Elijah, hoping Jezebel would not find us. We need to understand that undesirable and unpleasant things happen to us because we are in this world ruled by the devil. Christ himself said, there will be trouble because he knew that the devil is not going to let us go easy. He's going to attack us. And we need to discern, church, that those attacks are demonic in nature, schemes orchestrated by the devil to arrest and to intimidate God's elect in these last days. And we've got to be very careful. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says here, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's speaking to us, the believers. We've got to be very cautious, very alert in these last days. Be prepared. And I'm highlighting all these things to get us to point number one, which states that, there will be times in our life when praise don't make sense. When we talk about making sense of something, we usually mean that it's something that's understandable, that is agreeable to what is before us, and is logical and reasonable. But we find, apparently, this man of God, Prophet Abakub, was doing something that just don't make sense. He was standing in the midst of chaos of loss, of emptiness, of confusion and disappointment. You go back and read the scriptures in the book of Habakkuk. But he did something that sent shockwaves through hell and applause through heaven. In Habakkuk 3.18, he made this declaration. Prophet Habakkuk said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Basically, what Habakkuk said was, I've decided I will praise my God even when it doesn't make sense. I don't know about you today, church. Maybe someone here or someone that's hearing the gospel today or hearing this message being spoken to you. Maybe going through some health issues, some family turmoil, some financial issues in life. Very pressing some job uncertainties. There are many things that we go through in life. Children's issues. Well, 
What are we going to do about it? Let me tell you this. Do not let your feelings, emotions, and circumstances to overwhelm you and take over, church. Do not fret. Do not get depressed. Do not get angry at God or even doubt His love for you. Let us do what Abba Cook and the rest of our princesses of faith did. They had godly obsession to praise God and encourage themselves in the Lord. They put on the garment of praise to overcome the spirit of heaviness and burden. They opened their mouth and praised God. They gave God the praise that was due to His name, church. In Psalms 103, verse 1, the psalmist writes this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Obviously, God never promises elects with a problem-free life. But He promised this, to be with us in our sufferings. In Isaiah 43, verse 2, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burnt, nor shall the flame scorch you. What a promise this is to God's children. In Psalm 34, verse 19, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. All church. It means that nothing is excluded. All problems that we face in life, as a child of God, God is always there to be with us. And you know, oftentimes as elects, you know, we can even inculcate or cultivate an attitude whereby we choose to praise God only when life is smooth sailing. We are quick to give praises to God when everything is going on well. Instead, God always seeks His elects to have godly obsession, to praise Him even when things are not going their way. He doesn't take any confidence, faith, or effort to praise God when everything is going great in our lives. Don't you agree with me, church? It's very easy, right? Please don't get me wrong. Yes, we definitely need to praise God. During this time, you know, when something wonderful happened to us, God has been good to us, because, you know, God is glorified. But what really gets the attention of God is this. When we are ambitious with godly obsession to praise Him, even when it doesn't make sense, that really glorifies God because our faith is tested and we continue to fix our eyes on Jesus who is able to change our situations. Godly obsession to praise God during our times with tears may seem unattractive to some, unpleasant, but it pleases God who sees the sincerity of our hearts that praises Him no matter what the circumstances are. God sees deep into our heart. He sees faith in our heart to believe that He is able to help us and to guide us and to lead us out of that situation. And of course, there are several examples in the Bible. You know, in Job 1.1, we find that there's a man in the land of whose, whose name was Job and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. A good man. And go on, you read the scriptures, you'll say that he was one of the richest men in his time. And then in Job 1, 13 to 22, in 10 verses, we find that Job lost everything. What did Job do in spite of facing this great ordeal? Mind-boggling. It doesn't make sense. He praised God when it did not even make sense. He rose ran his mantle, shaved his head bald, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped God. Wow, church, that's faith, church. He understood that. End of the day, God is sovereign. In Samuel 30, verses 1 to 7, we find another fine example in the person of David. King David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, David gave God praises in the most adverse situation. You know, in the scripture, you'll find that David had been weeping and crying until he had no strength to weep. No doubt, David was physically exhausted. He didn't look like a great warrior at that moment or a great worshiper. His eyes most probably were swollen 
and bloodshot. But what he did next turned things around. In fact, what he did by praising God turned everything around. Right there in the middle of that agony, that pain, that suffering, he gave God a praise that made no sense, church. You go back and read the scriptures. Because he encouraged himself in the Lord and began to praise God because he knew that God is able to change the situation for him. What will praising God do to us when we are facing storms? A good question. How will praising God through the storm change our situation? Let me say this to you. Listen to me very carefully. Praise is one of our greatest gifts to God and one of our greatest weapons against our enemies. When we praise God, we are giving Him a gift and offering to Him. Sometimes situations, calamities, disasters, ordeals, tragedies, gives us an opportunity to praise God, to exercise our true faith in God's righteousness. You know, to make such effort, to turn our hearts to praise, when our hearts are full of grief, despair and worry, and fear is not going to be easy. It doesn't make sense. But this is what God is looking for. When we feel discouraged by life's circumstances like Prophet Abakuk, our beloved one may try to lighten us, our load that we are carrying, the burden, or even lift our spirits up. But you'll find that unfortunately, their efforts can fall short. We wonder if we will ever emerge from our trying situation with a joy intact. I know many go through that moment. I've gone through myself personally. No matter how much they try to help me, it never seems to always fall short. In Psalms 42 verse 11, this is what we should be doing. You know, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him my Savior and my God. It's a psalmist's way of strengthening himself. In Psalm 71 verse 14, But I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. And this is what we do. This is what King David did. Church, godly obsession signifies an inner determination and a forward-facing outlook. Elects need to persistently, continually, and repeatedly praise God. This allows us to focus on God, our Savior, the one who will bring deliverance and victory. Praising God in the hard times doesn't minimize or deny heaviness of heart. Let me say this to you. Instead, it redirects our focus on who God is. He's an unchanging God. He promises never to leave or abandon us. So we can count on His presence even when our emotions can't confirm it. This leads me to point number two, church. Praise sets up supernatural breakthrough. David gave God praise and God gave him a supernatural turn around. He received every single thing the devil had stolen. And I mentioned to you earlier, the scripture from Samuel, 1 Samuel. Maybe, I do not know, as you are hearing me preach this message, there is someone among you today who is one praise away from a miracle, one praise away from a spiritual breakthrough. Simply a turnaround. One praise away from family harmony. One praise away from turning lag into abundance. One praise away from fresh anointing to serve His righteousness. One praise away from a healing that has been long time coming. Let me encourage you by introducing Paul and Silas who praised God and set up for themselves a supernatural breakthrough from their predicament. I think most of you have read that portion of Scripture. In Acts 16, let me just paraphrase it for you. You know, Paul and Silas were very busy serving their master. When a certain girl possessed with the spirit of divination began to follow them, 
around saying, This man are the servants of the Most High God, which shows the way of salvation. This she did for many days. But Paul was grieved and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. When the masters of this girl saw that, the hope of their gains were gone. They caught Paul and Silas and began to accuse them of being troublemakers. Then the multitudes rose up together against them and beat them up with rods. And with the help of the magistrate, threw them into the inner prison with their feet shackled with chains. Then we see Paul and Silas there in the dungeon, humiliated, badly beaten, their clothes ripped off of their bodies. But what they did, at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises to God and the prisoners heard them. They were literally amused and astonished. They gave, you know, both Paul and Silas a praise that doesn't make sense at all, but at the power to invoke a supernatural act of God. Praise will set supernatural act of God. Right there in the midst of the darkness and pain, when most people would uh, have been crying and moaning and groaning and complaining and even deciding whether the ministry was worth or not, Paul and Silas gave God a praise, church. Wow. That's faith, church. That's godly obsession to praise God, no matter what the circumstances is. To the humiliation, to the fears and tears, to the pain, beaten black and blue, God was pleased with their godly obsession to praise Him with all cause. In Acts 16, verse 26, this is what happened. Praise will set up a supernatural act of God. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Hallelujah. Praise sets up a supernatural breakthrough. The jailer and his whole family got born into the kingdom of God that very night. Because these two men were not shamed to give God praise when it doesn't make sense. And in the process, they set up a supernatural breakthrough for themselves and the people around them. This is the power of the gospel of God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. There is something powerful when we, the elects, are ambitious to have godly obsession to praise God even when it doesn't make sense. God responded to Paul and Silas, shook the jail of his foundation. We found that even in the life of Job, God gave him back double of everything he had lost. God responded to David and he received everything the enemy had stolen. You can go on and on, church. You know, when we are in the storms of life, under fire from battles on numerous fronts, facing difficult trials, please take hope in God's supernatural power. Turn your heart to find praise for the God who loves us, who is fighting for us. Believe in God's great supernatural power and might and praise Him even when your heart is heavy laden. Know this church, when we have an ambition to praise God with a godly obsession, we become a recipient of many benefits in Christ. I've experienced it myself. I'm just testifying to you what God has done in my life. When I was in a most precarious situation with my health, I did this because I found that this is the only answer to my situation. I began to praise Him for all that He is. And what will happen? I found this church. God will fight with us. No matter what you're going through, God Himself personally will be present to fight with us no matter what is coming against us. That supernatural church, God fighting with us, you can sense it. He's with you. And that gives you 
tremendous amount of confidence. And God will protect us. His protection will be always there. No matter what's happening, everything is falling apart. But God's protection will keep us through. And I found that during this period, God refreshed and renewed my spirit as I kept praising God all the days of my turmoil. You know, God began to refresh me and renew my spirit. I also sense very strongly that God has actually given me an opportunity to give God a gift of praise, an offering of praise unto Him. Because now when I praise sincerely from my heart, God knows I'm in trouble, but yet I choose to praise Him and glorify Him for all that He is. And then I sensed, over time, my trouble seemed to become smaller. I began to see God as humongous and big. The problem became very minute as day went on. That really opened up my eyes to God's supernatural power that when we praise Him, even though it doesn't make sense when you're going through hard time, pain, agony, but yet God is at work. Church, I also saw miracles that is still possible because God is still a miracle working God. When everybody says negative things, God can turn it around and give you back whatever the devil stole or intends to steal from you. Because he is faithful, he is ever true to his promises, he is reliable, he is trustworthy, he is dependable. Because he is there with us. Church, today church, you have heard the message on godly obsession. We need to have that ambition in our heart. To praise God no matter what the situation is. I want to urge my brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Continue to praise him even though it doesn't make sense. You know why? Because you're actually setting up for a great spiritual breakthrough for you, your family, your children, and everything that matters to you. Thank you so much, church. God bless you.